I spent a lot of time on these slides, as you can tell. Um, read ahead. Um, we, 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 we love it. It gives us better performance. Um, so this kind of illustrates sort of what goes on when you do read ahead. So if, if you, if user space is reading one byte at a time, we do not, in fact, trouble the file system to read one byte at a time. Uh, assume we're doing page cache. <clears throat> we read like 64 kilobytes at a time. Um, and this is, this, is, this is for pipelining, right? We're assuming that there's a certain amount of latency between um, asking the file system to read a page and the page actually becoming up to date and being able to give it back to user space. Um, some of you are network file, file system people and you think you're special, you're not. This is, this, is, this is a problem for both disk as well as network file systems. It's even a problem when you're on SSDs. Yes, they're really, really fast, but you know, it's not instantaneous. It takes a little bit of time for the, uh, the flash chips to give up their data. Um, I mean, it's, 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 it's somewhat different problems, right? We, we run on a whole wide variety of storage. We, we, we run on, if you're networking, everything from uh, 10 megabits uh, ethernet all the way up to 400 gigabit. That's kind of a wide variety of um, latencies. Um, and of course, latency, you know, your, your, your server might, might be under your desk or your server might be halfway around the world. And the speed of light apparently is still finite no matter how hard we try. Um, and then on, on, on the block side, of course, you, you, you might be trying to do I.O. to some crappy USB key picked up from a vendor at a trade show, or you might have a nice shiny five gigabytes a second um, NVMe drive or a RAID array full of them. So, you know, the, like, we've, we've got a lot of different stuff to contend with here. <clears throat> um, but the, um, the network people seem more interested in making sure that this, this, this stuff works well for them than the uh, block storage people do. Um, the block, I, I find that block, block people seem to just say, oh yeah, the page cache sucks, never mind, I, I will do all my testing using direct I.O. Um, I mean, that's the part of the system that they can affect, right? They, 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 they um, uh, block file system people tend not to venture into the, into the page cache and say, hey, this, this, this sucks, this needs to get fixed. Be able to use the mic for that, or I can repeat it. When, the, when you say that, they usually you're looking to use fire to measure things like the link speed or the uh, block device speed. So they're looking to exclude effects that the page cache would have. Yes. We rarely do. We, I mean, if we do a performance measurement that includes read ahead, everyone says it's not valid. But in another sense, it's entirely valid because that's what users are actually seeing. And if if if, if we have these. Um, effects where we can see, uh, you know, performance cratering because we're not doing enough read ahead or because we're doing too much read ahead. Um, it would be nice if, if, if we were noticing these things before the user does. And then, you know, sometimes just responding to bug reports, right? And, and say, oh yeah, yeah that's, that, that, that's what's going on. Um, but I, I, I would like to hear more in the way of bug reports from people saying, hey, the page cache sucks and here's why. Um, I've, I've, I'm, I'm compiling a little list. I've, I've, got, I've, started, I've started a wiki page on kernel newbies for page cache problems, um, just so that you know no, no, nobody gets a bit too complacent about saying, "Hey, the page cache is awesome," because you know it, it is awesome in some ways, and in other ways, it's terrible. So the Android people have some problems that they've, they've noticed and, and they've, so, and being Android people, they have worked around it in the worst way possible. Um, they set the, I think it was the minimum or the maximum read ahead, uh, usually it's at 256K. And in order to get startup latency down by some fraction of a second, they wind it all the way up to megabytes, like hundreds of megabytes. Uh, and apparently that's, that, that helps Google Maps start up like a tenth of a second quicker or something. Um, okay, uh, it has other effects, but that's the only one they're measuring, so they, so they do it. 
Um, they've, they've tried to upstream some patches relating to that, and, and uh, we've said no. Um, so it looks like they should be using some sort of F advise instead. I want to read all of that file, please. Okay. Can, can we stop trying to pretend that user space knows what it's doing? I mean, come on, F advise? Seriously, I'm, I'm, not I'm not taking you seriously if you say F advise again right, in this M talk. advise. Okay, so I'm gonna take the microphone from Dave. <clears throat> but the Android use case is very specialized because they use a log structured file system on the phone, so expanding the read ahead does pull in most of the data they will eventually want for boot. Um, that would be true if read ahead were physical base, and it's not, it's virtual, virtual base. And it does that on YFFS2, which is what they're still mostly using. Yeah. <laughs> um, so I, I think we have a bunch of problems uh, to solve with read ahead. Um, and it, it, it affects all of us, right? I mean, um, I'm going to say the F word. Folios play into this a bit because uh, for, you, the use of larger folios is driven by read ahead right now um, and only read ahead at this point. Um, so the larger the read ahead gets, the larger the folios we create, which is kind of fun. It was good for testing. Um, I hope somebody says, hey, Matthew, you, you've done this all wrong and um, goes in and, and implements a, a, a better system. But it's, it's been really good for testing because if your file system supports um, large folios, they, they start getting used immediately. Like we start out by allocating um, order to folios. Um, and so far that's AFS and XFS. Uh, uh, patches for AFS and 9P to do this. They're not, I gave them to Linus, but he didn't take them because it was late in the merge window, but it works. Oh, so a a a AFS is not it, going to It didn't to get do, upstream, but did, did, I have did, the patch. It's, it's not in 519, it'll be in 520? Yeah. Okay. Okay. So and yeah, hopefully use... SIFS as well will be in there as well. Sweet. Looking forward to it. That's great. Um, so one of the problems that um, Steve French brought to my attention is that uh, Windows does really, really, really large read heads. I think four megabytes is what you said. Yeah, please. So just to give a context here, when you have normal latency over a network, the cost of sending each frame kind of outweighs the benefit of sending smaller I.O. that's closer to the size you want. So I did a lot of performance checks versus very various servers. And um, by default, I think the maximum, I don't know why it's set to this, I, I think some servers could set it to 16 meg, but 8 meg is the largest I saw. I saw some performance degradation in my benchmarks against various servers trying from various clients at 8 meg. It helped with some, hurt with others. But I saw large improvements from 256 to 512, big improvements 512 to 1 megabyte, slight improvements to 2 meg, and slight improvements to 4 meg. Um, but you know, in Azure, for example, we decreased it from 4 meg to 1 because other clients saw a slight degradation going to 4. I think NFS defaults to 1 meg, um, and uh, I default to 4 meg, but there are servers like Azure, for example, where it's going to negotiate 1 meg. But clearly, anything less than 1 meg will have performance unless you have a really fast network. Um, and the problem I see, though, is how do you throttle sanely? Because, yes, you can, there are credits and there's things that flow control things in network uh, block devices and network file systems. But this is a lot more than just simple flow control. There are cases where the page cache knows more than I do. And yes, I, I, sure, great. Send me, you know, one meg or four meg, great. There's cases where that's idiotic from your perspective. And what I don't know is how to kind of aggregate the information that you know from all data points, the page cache, the app level, and then of course the, the network server. I can tell you when the server is throttling, great, but that happens like 10% of the problem. A bigger problem is we want to, we want to handle this well. And um, so I, I kind of feel like some examples would help here because 
what I'd like to do is advise the page cache level that I prefer one meg or larger, give it a maximum level, but give it a lot of freedom to go to smaller I.O. Thanks, Steve. That, that, that is incredibly useful. Thank you. <clears throat> so we, we, we do have a mechanism for communicating between the file system and the, uh, the, 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 the VFS or the page cache, and that's the BDI, uh, the block device info. Um, badly named, because of course NFS actually has one, and I believe SIFS has one as well. Um, but that, that's where the VFS looks to find out kind of the performance characteristics of the underlying storage. Um, so if that gets updated, and, and maybe it doesn't have exactly the right information in it right now, but it's, it's like the way Linux is structured, that's clearly the right place to put it, because the reader head code does consult that to find out various things about the, uh, the storage right now, and uh, it, it can be extended or may, maybe just used correctly. I'm not, I'm not gonna say you're using it incorrectly, um, maybe, maybe not, I don't know. Um, so there's, there, there, there's definitely, so what, what, what we do now is um, we, we, we mark, so when, when, when we, um, uh, how do I do that? I swear there's a tool to let me highlight things on this. Yeah, I'll, 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 I'll just point. <laughs> Um, so we, we, when we do that first 64K read, uh, we, and remember the application we're talking about in this case is just reading one byte at a time, right? It's, it's a very stupid application. Um, it's theoretical, I'm just making it, making it up. Um, we, 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 we set a marker like, I don't know, 20, 20 kilobytes into that 64 kilobyte block. And we say, when we get to that point, we should kick off the next read ahead. And so this application goes along, and after 20,000 calls to uh, read of one byte, it gets to that, it, the, we, the page cache sees, oh, you're trying to read the page that's marked as being read ahead. Okay, I will now kick off the next read ahead. And so it sends the next 64K in the hope that the 64K that it's reading has returned by the time the application has done another 40,000 calls and got to the end of the 64K block that's currently been read. Um, well, that's, that, that's gonna depend on the latency, right? I mean, <laughs> how, how long does it take to get 64 kilobytes back? And the, 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 uh, the MM really has no idea at that point. It's just chosen some random point within, it's not entirely random, it's, it's, it's making a decision, but it's not really based on very much, that, uh, oh yeah, that, that read ahead that I did before was successful, it, it was useful, so I should do more read ahead. It doesn't, it doesn't have any kind of estimator to say, oh, that took this, this, it took this many microseconds to come back, I, I, I should schedule that earlier. But does that matter? I mean, what you're saying is that we, we have no idea what the latency is, so sometime it'll have returned way, way before we need it, and other times it'll be just in time. Does it benefit us if we tune it so that it's just, just in time? Oh, hang on, you, you, you're jumping ahead. <laughs> <laughs> Let me get to that. Okay, so 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 when it, when, it, when it reads that second 64k block, it's it's got to you know it 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 did it ahead of time. So the whole 64k block was actually optional, and it sets the was that read ahead useful right at the very very start. So as soon as you get to that second 64k chunk, it will say ah that was successful, and moreover it wasn't the it wasn't just. And it wasn't an I.O. I had to do anyway, it was an entirely speculative one, and it was useful, so I will grow my read ahead window. And it grows up to 128K, and again, it sets the read ahead marker at the beginning of that 128K. And so, you know, the same thing happens again, it does 256K, and then it stops at 256K. Now, what we could do is, and, and 256K is just the limit, and it's been the limit for 20 years. And, you know, I.O.'s hardly changed at all in that time, right? Um, so, what we could do is grow 256K, and, and from what Steve was saying, just growing that to one megabyte is probably the right thing to do, and we probably should have done it 10 years ago. And for, for cache files, at the moment it just caches pages, but I'm going to need to move to 256K or something blocks, mm -hmm. which 
means I need to, but currently we're using the expand, I'm using expand function to make this work, but that comes with another problem in that, not, not so much with a, an application like this, but one where it's doing random reads. If you get two random reads on two separate threads in the same 256K block, it will end up not ca being able to cache the block because the two reader heads will collide and stop somewhere between and I won't get the line blocks that I need, and so it'll drop both of them. Is, is that actually a real problem? Pardon? Is that a real problem, or is it something you've thought of? Oh, no, well, it is a problem that can occur, because you get... Oh, yes, I know, I know it can occur, but I'm saying, is there a real application that does that that you're trying to fix? Or are you just uh, trying to avoid problems? Uh, well... Yeah, well, only if it does. It, only if it's doing random linker, reads with multiple threads on one file, and they happen to collide. The linker, for example, because the, the linker, the, the GNU linker, seems to mmap files and read randomly from them. But it's single-threaded. True, at the moment. I guess if you're trying to link the same object file into two different, uh, the yeah. same type. Yeah. This, 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 doesn't, this doesn't sound like something which is actually happening, right? I mean, it's... it's, well, it's, it's, some, it's the, the, the code hasn't gone upstream yet, so it's, no one's <laughs> countering it yet. Well, how, how, about we, how about we see whether it's a problem before we fix it? <laughs> I'm trying I mean, to avoid it being a problem. Because I'm, I, I'm, I I'm trying to fix problems which actually exist right now. <laughs> we, we, can, we can fix the problems that you have once they well, actually uh, exist. Can, can we at least get it so we can tune the... To give a minimum block yes. size, so or yeah. say a line, line on this, because it's also when we're dealing something, because these aren't. I don't know whether the reader head blocks are always aligned. They're not. They're, they're frequently misaligned, yeah. actually. It, because it's possible with a file system like Ceph, where the objects are to, say two megabytes in size, but they were scattered all over the place. It would be really handy if a reader head didn't cross to objects on two different machines. Mm -hmm. So a two megabyte read is fine, if it, especially if it comes all from one, one object and one machine. Yeah, but I, I think we've solved that problem with the read ahead expand, right? That the, we, we, we can say, oh, yeah. you're, you're crossing a boundary. Well, <coughs> we'll round up to the next granule. So it, maybe, this yeah. one, maybe this read ahead happens to cross it, a granule. It might but be preferable to actually tell the read ahead in advance to no. honor the, uh, the boundaries. No. If, if it's just one number aligned to this, please. No. Yeah, and let's uh, also remember that the way you would, the, 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 let's take the simplest examples like copy, right? You're doing read ahead with copy, right? So this is really boring. You take a bad tool like rsync, right? rsync does small IO, um, and it's not as parallelized as you'd like. And then CP has some cool little tricks, right? CP can, can seek holes and things like that, but it's, but it's single threaded as well. Uh, on other operating systems, the copy tools are multi-threaded, so you could turn off caching and do some cool things if you're trying to actually back up your system. But, but we don't have a lot of choices for copy tools, and I know that three years ago, there was a great feedback on all these tools nobody's ever heard of, MCP and others that, that do better jobs. But we have to deal with dumb tools, right? They're gonna, they're gonna read, 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 read. But I wanted to give you guys some context at a very high level, and also ask maybe the NVMe guys, you know, their preferred IO size maybe, if I understand correctly, uh, for reads, their latency is, a, is not quite as good as you'd like, but their bandwidth is really, really high. So I would think even NVMe local devices, there's some advantage to these larger IOs. But to give you some context, I, we did some detailed stats on copy. We spent seven milliseconds roughly per frame um, if the copy, or sorry, if the read, um, because over the network a lot of these things are gonna be encrypted uh, or signed, Seven milliseconds is a lot if it doesn't have hardware offload in your, uh, so some, some algorithms, remember the TLS discussion, right, whether or not they're supported in the hardware, seven milliseconds is a lot of weight on one IO, dead time, nothing on the wire. Yeah. Using hardware offload, you know, SMB, many, most servers support that, um, it got down to about one, but that gives you a rough idea. If you spent on a typical VM one millisecond of dead time, nothing on the wire, waiting on that I.O., should we send two? Should we send three? Because that one millisecond of dead time doesn't count the network latency. I don't know how many, you guys know your network better, but you have a little bit of network latency dead time. But, you know, that dead time is avoided if we have, like, that expand 
discussion you were starting. Mm -hmm. um, and sanely doing that expand. Unfortunately, with Dave's patch that we looked at some examples, and there were cases where we had 4,000 IOs in flight, which is really, really, really bad. That's too many. That will do some bad damage. Think of network buffers, think of server queues, think of client queues. 4,000 is bad. So you know, that may just be a bug and something we were playing with. But, but getting the, the read ahead expand to the right matters uh, because that one millisecond is a best case for a lot of remote things because you're encrypting or signing. And that one millisecond, you could do a lot of other things. So I, I just want to ask you quickly, given the two bottom ones, which would you rather see? Would you rather see two 256K IOs or would you rather see one 512K IO? IO? And bear in mind, these are, these are both read aheads. The, the, the application hasn't asked for these yet. They, they may, all, that whole 512K bytes of data may be in vain. No, 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 I'm, I'm saying, w would you rather see two packets back to back to hit the server, each asking for 256K, or would you rather see one packet that hit for the whole 512K? In most cases, the, the two 256K look, look better. If you got down to 64K, maybe not. Sure, yeah, I, I understand. This would be collapses at both ends of the spectrum. But, but in general, the two 256 is better. Is better? Okay. Now, I have a different problem that's maybe a design bug than NFS and some others do. Um, if I'm writing stuff, stuff gets paralyzed, great. It uses whatever thread came in. I can, Jeff Layton did great stuff launching async threads for that. Uh, on the read path, uh, Windows and some other servers do a great job of forking lots of socket reads. So you have one socket, perhaps. It depends on multi-channel. So if I have multiple channels, multiple sockets to the same server, and that's the default that many clients use. When they mount, they automatically set up two sockets, automatically. So they don't have any serialization issues on read because they're gonna read from multiple sockets. Um, and uh, the server will expose multiple, you know, it has no problem if it, the client opens multiple sockets. It was ironic to me that most workloads behave better even if there's only one network adapter with two sockets. Um, anyway, I thought that was kind of a curious, odd thing. Um, and, but in general, yes, the, the two 256 would do better than one 512. Of course, in a perfect world, you have four 512 and we're happy. Well, how, how about eight 256K? Yeah. Okay, okay, cool. All right, so you want to jack up read ahead size. Uh, actually, I don't. A, a lot of people are proposing that we jack up read ahead size. What I want to do is jack up read ahead, the number of outstanding 256K read ahead. So right. I, I want to do the, 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 the top one. I, I, I want to send out like four, eight 256K requests and because that way we get so much more information back about the application usage patterns. Okay, so instead of going to the 512, you want to send out you know, two 256 in this case, right? Okay. And you want to do this partly for performance, so yeah. we're reading ahead more, so we're more likely to have a cache hit, which in this case, we've already had two cache hits row, yeah. so we know it's probably gonna be okay. Um, and the other reason is because you want to allocate larger folios, right? Is that what I heard you say in the beginning, is that you wanna be able to do the that's kind of a side effect. That's just a it, side it, effect. It's, that's, that, 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 that doesn't, that's not my primary motivation. It's kind of a cool thing that happens to also happen, but. Okay. I, like with all of this stuff, you know, benchmarks, right? I, like, you give me FIO jobs, I put in my nightly testing, we see how it goes and see if it goes better or worse. Mm -hmm. Fantastic, and I can even just like baseline and then apply your patches and then test. And then, because like, you know, it is sort of ridiculous. We're kind of like, and we haven't changed it in 20 years. I say, screw it, let's increase it and see what happens, right? But the thing is, is like, historically, we don't keep track of this kernel over kernel. ButterFS is, so you give me stuff and I'll run it, and hooray, we get the data. And we need to do that in general for this. It makes sense. I'm gonna say that, yes, go for it, see what happens. Um, I do sort of worry about the larger, like you say it's a side effect, but that's a significant side effect of like suddenly we have larger pages that 
may or may not be used, and what does reclaim look like? And there's knock-on effects of increasing read head size mm -hmm. that might hurt some workloads. I'm not saying you don't do that for those nebulous, undefined reasons, but I think we need more information, right? I, I agree with every word you've said, Joseph. Um, I, I, I will say, you know, if we once we find these workloads, there are things we can do to start addressing them. Like we can be way less aggressive about scaling up uh, folio size, right? And I, I think we should be. It's only like that because I needed to do some testing. Right, and I, and so I'm not saying that. Like again, I'm not saying we make these don't make changes because of nebulous things. I yeah. say that when the nebulous things happen, we address those. We build tests for those. We do that, and we yeah. just assume that what we have or you write tests to show where the improvement is, and then when we find counterexamples, we have tests for those, and we make changes there. Again, I agree with every word you just said. So, something to think about? Uh, oh, I, was gonna, I was just going to answer your, Willie's question from uh, from st standpoint of someone who works on network file systems, and that is you would far prefer the larger I.O. Uh, set up overhead for a read. Uh, it can be pretty substantial on a network file system, so uh, you know, if we could do fewer fewer RPCs in general, it's it's much more cost effective for us. You know, you know server side overhead as well. So, uh, you know, that sort of thing can you know, in general, we want to prefer larger IOs when we get away with it. Was was, was that Jeff Layton, Layton speaking? Okay. Uh, hey, Jeff. Yeah. Um, the um, so so you're actually arguing with Steve French there because Steve says he'd rather see uh, eight two fifty six k, and you're saying you would you would rather see uh, one, two megabyte. It depends on the file system. Yeah, yeah, so I, I agree. SIFs. Yeah, and, and it's not just file system. I, I, I think, think that for SIFs, because SIFs is pretty similar. Uh, you know, it has pretty significant setup overhead for, for reads and writes as well. So, uh, you know, I would think too that we would want larger IOs on SIFs yeah. as well. We definitely saw advantages in every single example I, I did with the current page cache, right? Going every single server we tried up to one megabyte. There was one example, Azure, where we didn't, we saw some advantage to two, but no, none to four. But to every other server, we saw advantages to four, and then it was mixed on eight. So that's megabytes. That's megabytes. Right. So if you were talking about a single I.O. in flight, absolutely, absolute no question. I can't imagine a network case where smaller than one meg makes sense. Yeah, I mean, I, I think the reality is uh, it's always going to depend on the file system and the storage device, right? If we're talking about really, really th slow USB thumb drives, even a 256K read ahead, never mind a one meg read ahead, may start getting painful. And if you're on a very, very small memory device, doing large read ahead has other knock on effects, right? And so there is not going to be any one magic read ahead formula that is going to be good for everyone. The only question is where is the squeaky wheel, right? So to that end, I have a suggestion, which is uh, we should, granted that the average user will never use this, right? But think about allowing the read ahead algorithm to be overridable via eBPF program, because that will make it easier for people to experiment. And then they can actually present the results. It would not surprise me if in the future, the read ahead algorithm ends up being, you know, if you are on file system foo, it should be this um, default. Uh, maybe the read ahead algorithm should be monitoring read and throughput latency and auto adjust um, based on that. And then I submit that it will be much easier to experiment with what the auto adjustment algorithm should be in eBPF than forcing people to like, you know, modify kernel code, right? Because if you make an eBPF program, then we can throw an intern or a grad student as a research project to figure out ideal um, read ahead algorithms because we're not going to get it right. And, you know, if we make it easy to experiment, then maybe we can change the read ahead algorithm and tune it, you know, every three years instead of every 20. <laughs> you know, I was going to start arguing with you about that. And then I'm glad you kept talking because I, I think you've persuaded me. 
that I can just make this somebody else's problem. My, <laughs> my, 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 my fear is that the Android people are just going to turn everything up to 11 and say, hey, my, 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 my phone launches whatever app 0.1 second faster than, than, than our competitor, so you should buy our phone. And, and you know, it would be like, eh, whatever. And but yeah. So just as a data point, Jan pointed out in chat that uh, SUSE has had 512K set for their read ahead size for years. Oh, perfect. Great. Let's let's set it to one meg. Because <laughs> if, it's, if, it's, if it's been set to 512 for years, then we should clearly set it to one meg now, right? Hey, Chuck. Hi. Um, I'm kind of concerned about this conversation because we're greatly oversimplifying the problem. Um, the the oversimple example that you started with was a, a program reading one byte at a time. There's no reason to increase the read ahead window in that case. Just keep reading 64K, and you'll keep up with that program. The problem with reading 512 and one megabyte and two megabytes is that suddenly you've got a huge amount of data in your page cache, and that program may not get to it, and it may be reclaimed, and then it would have to be read again. Um, there's this other, there are other problems. The mix of I.O. that's going over uh, network fabric, if you've got a bunch of small metadata operations like get adders and things like that, those are going to be held up behind a one megabyte read, substantially held up, and that will cause a lot of uh, outlier latencies for other programs that are running on the system. So I'm kind of concerned about jacking up the size of read ahead significantly. This is speculative um, data that you may or may not need. Um, so I think we should be careful about, about exactly how this is going to be changed. Um, so maybe I'm echoing Ted's concern. Maybe we should be thinking about ways we can make it uh, a lot easier to experiment. Um, eBPF is an interesting idea, but you know that's something that the researcher, him or herself, can do. I don't think we need to put that in the main mainstream kernel. Um, but I, experimentation is is a number one. I think we need to investigate. And we need to to have a wide variety of workloads that are running at the same time to understand the systemic effects of of um, um, increasing read ahead. Thank you. So uh, to make it easier to experiment, I added a mount option I don't know, a year or two ago for RA size, right? Because we don't use the BDI thing anymore, right? There's a RA size or whatever. So RA size, if I, I have R size that's controllable, so I could set it to whatever, you know, 512, 256, one meg, whatever, and RA size. And so with simple examples, I saw the, the primary benefit I saw with RA size was only when I was running multiple channels, so I didn't have the serialization issues, but I saw significant, like I could see tripling of performance by increasing RA size. Um, and I, so I just added a mount option. It's not set by default, but your intern can try that. I assume other file systems have the same thing. Oh, we just use the BDI, and I'm cutting us off because it's lunchtime. So uh, the remote people, I'd like to point out that the uh, schedule has something for you guys to join um, after lunch, which is now in 50 minutes. It's to give you guys a chance to like voice your opinions about how the virtual aspect of this has gone. Okay, we'd also like to see you. I don't know how that's going to work, but turn on your cameras. Um, but that's happening after lunch, so in 50 minutes if you want to come back for that. Thanks. Thanks.